Good evening. So sometime in the early 20th century, artists began to give themselves permission to do things and make things that didn't resemble art. Um, the first example that came to my mind was um, Marcel Duchamp, who uh, in 1917 signed a urinal with the name Arose Celebi, actually, which is kind of close to the name of the artist who's presenting tonight, Arose Celebi. Um, he signed a urinal and called that art. Actually, four years earlier in 1913, he took a snow shovel, wrote in advance of the broken arm on it and called that art. He called those ready-mades. Um, fast forward and skipping a lot of artists who did things that didn't resemble art in 1967. Some of you may be familiar with the work by the British artist Richard Long, who walked back and forth in a, a paddock kind of a, a meadow, stony meadow in the highlands in Northern England. Uh, and over time made a line in the grass, um, a path, he called that a line we made by walking and called that art, walking back and forth. Uh, in 1979 and 1980, the New York based artist and mother of children, but also of socially engaged art, Meryl Laderman Eucalyz, um, shook the hand of every single New York City sanitation employee, all 8,500 of them, and called that art. In 1983, Pope L sold snowballs in on Astor Place and called that art. To paraphrase the art historian Rosalind Krauss, these artists expanded the field of art to include all kinds of things everyday objects, everyday activities, like walking or shaking hands, social work, television, the human body itself. A comprehensive list of the ways in which artists expanded the field of art in the 20th century would be very long. Put another way, these artists gave us the freedom to blur the boundaries of art and everything else under the sun, everything else that we can imagine, anything else that we can imagine. But just in an interesting position as artists, right? Um, a lot of freedom to choose. Our guest tonight is Rose Salon, an artist whose work explores the intersections of art, this is my take, I'm not sure you would agree, of art, cultural anthropology, and archaeology. Using, and these are her words, everyday objects as her entry point, she excavates the systems of evaluation, exchange, and organization that shape urban life. Research, which in Rose's case involves the gathering and analysis not only of information, but also of objects, Research meets the art world in finely crafted display objects. I would could call them displays, but I think of them actually as kind of image objects that contain other objects. Carefully crafted, finely crafted display objects in which textual captions accompany carefully arranged artifacts like coins or rings. You may have seen her work in the most recent Whitney Biennial on the fifth floor, way in the back on the right, um, or also in the most recent um, New Museum Triennial. Her work has been featured in solo exhibitions at the Hessel Museum of Art, which is at Bard College in Annandale on Hudson, New York, up in the Hudson Valley, the MIT List Visual Art Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, also at Carlos Ishikawa, a gallery in London, and also via a chapter gallery here in New York City. Other group exhibitions include Lomex Gallery here in New York, Gems Gallery, Company Gallery, uh, in Guangdong, China, the Guangdong Times Museum, 
Elsie Quiser in Tbilisi, Georgia. James Fuentes uh, Gallery here in New York City. Roncini Gallery in London, and also Paul Kasman Gallery here in New York. Rose received the Paulette Krasner Foundation grant just this year, and also this year did a residency. This is one for you guys to put on your list, the Archaeological Park of Pompeii. Cool. Maybe not unless you're doing the kind of archaeological work that, that Rose does, or maybe so. Um, Rose Salon has a BFA from Cooper Union and an MA in urban planning from the City University of New York. Please join me in giving a warm and hearty welcome to Rose Salon. Okay, I'm just gonna make sure I'm at a good height for this microphone. Um, thank you, um, Mark and Isabel, so much for inviting me to um, speak to everybody tonight. Um, and also thank you for that really great introduction. Um, I think just one friendly, maybe, uh, correction. I believe that the uh, Pope L wasn't selling the um, the snowballs. It was David Hammond's. And I remember that because there is a section of Cooper Union, which I went to, I, I, as you mentioned, I went to Cooper Union. And I just look at that little corner all the time because that's where David had the blanket with like the different size snowballs and then the iconic picture of everybody around those snowballs um, purchasing it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a beautiful work. So <laughs> regardless. Um, so yeah, I'd like to start out with basically looking at my practice over the last um, five or so years. And I'm gonna share projects with you that really helped shape the way that I work today. And I think um, as artists and as young artists, the, a practice is constantly developing. And I think um, listening to how you develop and what you become inclined to work with along the way is, it, is in, extremely important for um, growth and I'm still going through that. So, um, so I'm gonna begin with this project that um, set up a big um, kind of framework of working. And it started with this object that I, it's a postcard that I purchased on eBay. Um, and I purchased three of them at the time. And while I was working on this piece, I was also um, thinking about aspects of New York City that have kind of stuck with me throughout the years. And, and just a little background, I grew up in New York and I was um, raised in Queens and um, constantly viewing the city from a distance. So anytime I would come into the city, it would be by way of my parent or um, just seeing the city through a commuter's uh, framework. So taking very long subway rides into um, major parts of Manhattan. So those things sort of stuck with me around this project. And the questions I had are kind of surrounding eras that I think shape our lives very much so when you are, if you're from New York or you, you know, grew up in the generation that I grew up in, um, aspects that you are unknown. So this project deals a lot with, um, or focuses on the site of uh, the World Trade Center. And um, it focuses on it in the sense that it looks at history pre 9-11 and questions just the tone and the access points of New York City in the 80s. Um, so I purchased three of these postcards from eBay and I had received a message from the seller asking if I had any connection with the site itself because of my the amount, of, amount of postcards I purchased. And so this postcard somehow initiated this really rich exchange with this woman that ended up telling me through email that she had worked at this at Windows on the World, which is a restaurant um, on the um, 107th floor of the World Trade Center for around um, 12 years, so from 1981 to 1993. And I found that those years were just, I, I had at the time been reading this book called um, The Gentrification of the Mind by Sarah Shulman speaking about the um, AIDS epidemic in New York City um, 
And I just so happened to be in contact or I've become in contact with Deb Brody that this is the woman on the other side of the emails. And through that postcard, she started to share a lot of her time um, uh, that she spent working at Windows on the World. And she was a reservations agent there. Um, and this was an interesting perspective because it was almost like you, for, through an object, I was meeting an individual and an individual that had so much information about a time period that I wasn't available for, like literally not alive for. Um, and a series of questions started, started to begin. It was also at the time when I was um, really considering on doing the urban planning degree and trying to figure out how I can relate to structures that are not available or you know I can't re-enter sites and also questioning change. And so through her, through meeting her, she ended up sharing all of these amazing photographs that she took and um, as well, you know, learning that she was a photographer in her own right. And um, what was amazing was that she actually carried a camera throughout her the uh, 12 years working at Windows. And I thought that this was also an interesting point and, or an interesting intersection into understanding technology and the ways that we have information very readily available. So, you know, this is around um, the late 80s and she's not, we don't, you know, we don't have the uh, iPhone, we don't have the uh, social media sharing platforms. So I think that these are these photographs that become very um, rooted in purpose in terms of just having the, the tactility of a, of, a, um, of a document at that time was also something that was very much um, keeping me in conversation with her during this project, among many other things. And so through, again, through the postcard and through understanding that she had taken several, like, I would say hundreds of photographs through documenting her site of work. Um, together, we would spend a lot of time on the phone and I would ask her questions about um, uh, of her time working there. And again, this, this is a relationship that was developing probably over the course of half a year. So um, this being one of the first projects I've, I've done in this way um, ended up teaching me a lot about how to how to very carefully and respectfully interact and um, ask questions about somebody's time and experiences in a site, especially a site that is, of course, has so much um, um, pain and confusion and, you know, in, in every regard. Um, and I thought it was also important to kind of reveal a history that Perceive that that basically is before you know that um, impact that we see the World Trade Center as is the site of you know um, this very uh, difficult site to kind of unpack and um, so we basically like went through a series of different perspectives. Um, this one talks about uh, moments in, in the restaurant where she remembers seeing Grace Kelly and um, Andy Warhol and David Dinkins, who was the mayor at the time. And um, and it's kind of a funnier uh, uh, writing about how uh, when you entered the site of, uh, when you entered Windows on the World, you couldn't uh, wear jeans. And so what was, basically offer to certain celebrities was that they could wear chef pants over their jeans. And so just to keep up with the dress code, which I found was kind of interesting to understand the role play of labor and the role play of, um, of uh, hierarchies in, in terms of, you know, an, an individual and like where they, where they have access to. And this project is again, like quite, in, intense and significant for me because we're, Deb and I basically, or Deb kind of walks me down the, the road of the 80s. Um, and so this is an article that has uh, a story that is depicting um, co-workers 
that she's noticing get, uh, becoming very ill and it's due to AIDS. And so she, this is an image that she had taken of a friend of hers um, that had passed away from AIDS and they were in there in the um, cafeteria and she would have lunch with him every day. And I think what I was noticing is we would just kind of walk down this lane of, of uh, big markers throughout history is that there's aspects of the everyday that become so repetitive and lodged in one's memory. And at the time of making these pieces, um, I was myself working at a restaurant and I thought that you know, when you work in service and you you work um, doing these very repetitive actions, like you sometimes cling on to memory in this way that's like unexplainable and things that you, you know, you remember or you do or are sort of um, almost robotic. And so it was quite interesting to hear her recall these moments of of how she responded to the, the uh, service work environment and, and um, and also seeing things happen alongside that. So one of them being AIDS and, and how many people were suffering and becoming very ill. And another one was also um, when Nancy Reagan had entered in, uh, and visited Windows on the World. This is a quite a funny article about how um, Deb and all of her coworkers had to kind of hide in a specific, um, uh, office uh, room so that the first lady could uh, basically pass by and there was, you know, nobody in her way. Um, and this is a pin from the um, Just Say No, uh, her war on drugs, essentially, that was at the time trying to mask the early parts of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and then uh, the image is from Deb's office and um, I guess I should also say that there was an aspect of my practice in the beginning where I was writing these articles and these kind of you know sound bites of information that um, ended up becoming uh, more narrative based when I got to this project with Deb, and it was a way for me to kind of lodge um, this type of oral history. I think this is something that Deb's project ended up changing about my earlier articles. But I always find, found the articles to be that this um, blueprint of memory, meaning that you have image and text and then this format of a public notice. And it's kind of this clipping from a larger, what we understand, you know, a newspaper to be a larger like series of events that happen. Um, so these are all written by, by me and they're taken from conversations that Deb and I had. They're just a little bit more, um, they have a little bit more narrative in them um, as opposed to just a straightforward transcript. And so th this is also, this is going into the end of the um, 80s, early 90s, I believe 91. Um, this is right before Deb ends up leaving uh, Windows on the World. And it, this article starts to talk about the um, heightened security that starts happening at Windows. Um, and that the uh, Port Authority um, that owned the World Trade Center was asking um, uh, Windows on the World workers to have meetings and um, be able to recognize what a bomb looks like. So Deb recalls like uh, basically people from the Port Authority being like, oh, this pack of cigarettes, they the article describes this, this pack of cigarettes could potentially be a bomb, so you should keep all this stuff in mind. And um, I found that kind of interesting because it's like these kind of, you know, jerks of what would potentially happen in, in a few years later. And then of course, you know, during 9-11, that um, the disaster. And so this is then the end of the series. And basically what happens is in, in this article is Deb describes um, the 93 bombing and how people that used to work at Windows would have now have to work in a security check-in desk at the front, um, the, the main level of the World Trade Center. And I also thought that these images were really important because I hadn't really seen these online or maybe even in many newspapers, but um, this type of uh, you know shift of 
the positioning of being really high up and then being now asked to be on the ground level and do something that you weren't set up to do, but is, is quite fascinating for um, the change of tone and, and um, the change in security that happens and takes place in these buildings. Um, and then but these are playing cards that have the Windows on the World um, uh, logo. And so they were all like set up in, in this manner in this show at Company Gallery and you would kind of enter each um, uh, article as like kind of a vignette and um, and also the object that's next to this article was is I, I found extremely important because it was all these small little pieces that Deb was able to take back with her from every day, like very random events that became, um, of course, monumental, but like together they created a collection that describes her, I believe, her time working there. This little bowl was is um, depicted in, in the center of the table, which is uh, the postcard, the previous slides. And this is also coming from a time when I had been doing casting and I was very interested in like pouring into um, fabrics and into objects and then just ripping out the fabrics and having that mark be, you know, remain. And um, so it's, it has a moment of my earlier works in it as well. And so we reprinted the postcard and then on the back of the postcard, we indicated that um, the, the kind of, um, well, I wanted to call it a conversation between us, but the Indigo 237 is her, um, was her eBay name. And so that's kind of an early example of how I was dealing with object, um, objects, um, individuals, and then this type of like dynamic pairing that kind of ends up spilling out of an object that's been held on to for a long time. And also an individual that was working in a site that was extremely, you know, an extremely dynamic site that is no longer available. Um, and then this, in this work, um, something, I approach objects in a different way. I'm approaching it in this setting through um, sort of a system, but this is another instance of, um, or an, another actually section of the World Trade Center. This is um, aspects of the Port Authority Library that were was situated on the 55th floor. And it actually closed uh, not, be, it closed way before 9-11 in 1995. And the Port Authority was trying to figure out a place to house this their archives in the library. And what they had done was compact, uh, compiled the library physically into the sub basement of one of the towers and then had um, digitized everything onto a floppy disk and dispersed it between a few uh, different transit libraries in the New York, New Jersey area. And I had met a woman that had received one of these floppy disks. And um, this was back in uh, 2018, around then end of 2018, early 2019. And um, I was just kind of shocked to see this archive, um, the, the way that I, I'm gonna explain how the books and everything were laid out, but basically that's the archive on the shelf. It's, she had sent me that in a digitized form. Um, and it looked like this and this, so this woman, Carol, who worked at one of the libraries that was um, hoping to receive this, uh, this archive, um, had it still digitized on her computer. And I think what, what I was really interested in is how the, basically how the hand ends up preserving um, these large information sets. And um, it can preserve through either happenstance or just purpose, but either way, it's somehow, somehow this was preserved. Um, because otherwise, I, uh, it was destroyed in the 9-11 uh, attacks. It was just being housed there for a long period of time. But um, so basically I had received this and I was combing through it and um, I had, it was quite difficult to navigate for a long time. But then I started to see books that I was interested in. So 
um, for example, these aspects of how this moment in time, so it was in 1994, how they were predicting and projecting onto the future. Um, and also it was just at the end of the, or just a few years after the Cold War and so there's a lot of books around that and also a lot of books around American foreign policy. So it's a very, like, it's a quite politically forward and workers library. That's basically who was using it, members of the Port Authority, and then it was also open to uh, the public as well, but um, a lot of engineering books. And, um, and I just found it kind of interesting, the tones of voices that were in these books and was just thinking that how would we, you know, if any library was like closed or shuttered, or how would we would we approach it in you know 20, 30, 40 years? Um, and as well, how much of this gives information as to as to how we got to the place we are today politically, like um and so those things is those ideas were very much um kind of floating around my head while I was making the show, but I had basically selected a series of books that I thought would be um, informing those questions. And you could view them as they were on the shelf. And um, basically the system I created was in light of, uh, of kind of how the system, I was looking at the huge archive through, which was the call numbers and the titles. And then you can, of course, hold and look through the books. And I had left like certain, um, markers throughout them. So um, these call numbers on the shelves are linked up to um, these frames pieces. And these framed works basically are kind of um, mashups in a way of certain texts that I had found throughout the books and then also personal experiences. So in this case, this was actually another collaboration with my uh, Deb and her photographs. And it was um, uh, a kind of a, it was an article about um, technology, but Deb explains that she, uh, you know, her and her coworkers are waiting for um, the uh, people at Windows to update them with computers when they just had fax machines. and everyone else was getting a, you know, a standard computer and they weren't. Um, and, and then also the, the archive kind of, um, or this, this layer of archiving that I've done, um, brought forward some more personal uh, types of um, relating, which is a, um, image of my mother and her uh, sister and my grandmother in front of an SO sign. And I had been kind of interested in like the Rand Corporation and their mention um, throughout the, the library itself is like, you know, this think, think tank that comes out of World War II and it's a private think tank and, um, and uh, a lot of, you know, security and speculation on different um, uh, operations throughout the world. And, um, it, it was just like a very interesting and very strange and a little bit scary of uh, a memorandum that I had found um, through by way of the library. And um, it was just so happened to be at the same time my mother was in that picture. And then they were looking at the um, standard oil uh, um, kind of uh, places that were uh, stationed in Peru and, it was just kind of overlapping of in different institutions and then memory. So um, I found that that was like a big part of this narrative that the library had is that, you know, you have this institution that kind of is upheld through the language. And then you also have people that were there, like, of course, experiencing on the ground um, uh, realities that came out of these institutions. And so, yeah, these were, again, other frames that were um, shown alongside the library. And this one was actually for the um, librarian herself, Carol, and basically talking about her role as a librarian for um, 20, over 20 years. Um, and I had met her when she was just about to retire. Um, but so, yeah, so then, so that was almost like a system uh, 
a display of like when you find um, an object and how it opens up into these types of dynamic negotiate, not negotiations, but dynamic ways of um, understanding the time in which it existed in. Um, and I always like to show this um, image because this starts to zoom out a little bit and starts to talk about, you know, scale and these ways that I'm I'm really interested in. Um, I, I mean, the previous objects are quite small, but then I think what I do sometimes is play this like balancing act of scale of uh, of just kind of questioning um, potentials and objects. So this is an image of the 2003 blackout. Um, and it's in, in New York, it's right by Penn Station. And I just like have this, I had this around during these, um, this project, this next project that I'm gonna speak about because of this overhead view of a crowd that I found was very similar to the overhead view of these objects that I had um, been really interested in acquiring. And so this was my first project I did with um, these rings that were um, lost and then found in the in the subway system here. I had purchased them from the MTA and there were 94 rings. And I remember approaching this project through this image because that's the only access I had to it. And um, so that image, the previous image of the overhead crowd is the reason why I was like, oh, this, this is just something, there's something so beautiful about this. It almost seems like all of these lights are on with these rings and like there's so much potential of energy and all of these questions I had. Um, and so I would kind of in the studio, you know, have them laid out in this way. And, and just, I remember meditating on like, how am I supposed to sort of question where, or not even question, how am I supposed to even work with this like amount of, uh, you know, amount of questions. Um, I just remember having so many like tangents of, you know, what if this happened to this ring or like, how, how am I supposed to display it? And like, so it was just an incredible set of objects to have been um, faced with. And so over time I was, you know, finally like figuring out what to do. And I come up to this point where I was thinking about different circumstances of how we perceive value. And this first, um, set of questions of value I had for myself was, is it possible to kind of retrace some sort of, you know, genetic value or, or like, is there any type of like, um, you know, are there skin cells left on the rings or is there any type of trace that could be amplified from that? So I remember going to this um, community biology lab that is very accessible for artists called Gen Space. And I, I posed that question to the biologist there. I, was, I asked, do you think if we swab the rings there of um, kind of with certain like forensic materials, would, would we be able to even yield any results of you know, just picking up anything about the person, the previous owner. And, you know, they kind of were, had a few questions around it and it wasn't the easiest um, endeavor, but we actually did find um, a, a set of DNA um, that we could actually get uh, sequenced. So what we were looking for is mitochondrial DNA, which is the longest and, or which is the most, um, passed down strongest form of DNA from, from your mother. And it's a, it, it will just only tell you the um, haplogroup group that, and so ancestors uh, that you've originated from and what section of the world. So that would be the haplogroup. group. And um, I found this process kind of interesting for a different way of working in terms of just understanding how much information how hard it is to get information from certain fields to yield results. So in science, it's like, it's a very much a yes or a no, or, you know, there could be like, of course, potential hypothesis, hypotheses, but it's just usually, you know, if you don't get results, there's no, 
it's it's not like we're speculating on like another approach. So it's a very direct way of receiving information. And I found that to be really interesting and the labor associated with it was also really interesting. So this was um, when we ran a, when we would, uh, if we, basically it's, um, you would swab a ring and then you put it through a series of processes, processes and we would basically do a PCR and have to um, put that solution into a gel. And if you got results that were, you know, you, you got results that uh, could, could be sequenced, it would look like this. So this is basically a test on the left and then a ring on the right, the bands um, that would, we'd be able to process that at a lab. Um, but then I was thinking, you know, that would, it was just not enough information to, to, to actually have a complete view of what, what these rings were, or, or I guess it, it wasn't good to just land on science. I was thinking at the time it was really important to kind of counter that narrative and, um, and also find something that would yield more information. So I then were, began taking these rings to um, pawn shops and I had a, a jeweler look over them and just to you know, determine any type of um, material value and, and also see how material value is determined. You know, like it's the melt value, it's the weight, it's the usually like if you have a ring and you wanna sell it for, um, the weight of gold or silver and they would just immediately if you know your diamond wasn't real just like take it out and melt it down so the sentimentality gets very much diminished and it goes back into this just it's kind of first state or um and i found that to be really interesting because i was at this point realizing that i was recirculating this object back into a lot of different viewpoints so that brought me to the last um, set of information, which was uh, speculate, very heavy speculation that was given to me by a psychic. Um, so I would bring the rings to this to the multiple psychics, and we would sit down and basically look over them, and and I would spend large amounts of time sitting with one person or. Um, what would be a series of you know people and look we would look over the rings and we would essentially just spend time and telling stories i mean i wouldn't tell the stories they would but um i found that to be really interesting again for the the third layer of of recirculating this object back into to the eyes of of uh, the public um and then kind of throughout these projects that I do, I end up seeing the same sort of force in the world again, if that makes sense. Like, I think that these um, these instances keep cycling. And I think that's really interesting when we think about loss within an object, within an urban environment, within um, a crowd. And so I think that goes back to this big question of, as to why, like, um, I don't know, why does this repetition keep happening of we lose specific objects of sentiment that are like so small and so little to be, and so easily disengaged from us. And so I just put that image in there because I find it, it, it um, when I see these moments in the real world, it reminds me of, of why I, I have these questions in the first place. Um, and so this is how we ended, or I ended up formatting the rings basically, five exist in, in one frame. And the reason why I like the amount of, or the reason why I gravitate towards a, a larger amount in a frame is because um, it's nice for a viewer to choose which one they would potentially want to read or, or whatever they gravitate to. And um, also these rings having, having been lost and then found on the subway. I think this setup just, at least for me, like reminds me of when you're kind of sitting in front of somebody and you don't, you don't know who they are. Like, you know, you just kind of have these 
it could be anything, just sort of just questions that are very wandering questions um, or appreciations or, you know, just kind of you exist in the same subway car and you're doing the same commute or you're, you're basically alive at the same time. So you're just observing them. Um, and I found that that was kind of interesting for this uh, setup. And also the important thing is that the object is there and then the information set is below it. And, um, and yeah, it, it details each and every ring and you can see the different chunks of available information. Some have more than others. This is an example of when um, we sequenced one. And that's how the language of when you sequence a, a DNA code would read. And so together that they're shown in this um, grid and um, again, it gives more, it, it gives more uh, choice to the viewer to see which ring, you know, is aesthetically pleasing or what story is more interesting than the other one. And so that set of rings set up this kind of way of thinking about loss and thinking about um, the recirculation of of an object through the world. And I had um, found another friend <laughs> um, that she was doing metal detecting on the beaches of Atlantic City. And it was amazing because she was a neighbor of my parents actually. And then she was um, selling a lot of things in her house because they were, her and her um, husband were moving. And I just happened to kind of go there one day to the, the sale and she was selling all these rings. And I had asked her, you know, why do you have all these in this kind of way that's, it was just very, uh, very neatly kept. And there was a lot of them. And so I asked why, um, why she had them. And she said that she had metal detected them on the shores of Atlantic City. And I thought that was so funny because this kind of random occurrence of losing something, the accumulation and the finding, it, it just had so many, of course, parallels to the, the MTA rings um, or the rings that were lost in the subway. And I just had to acquire them. So then I, when I acquired them, I had to, again, interpret them in a different, but very, but similar way. So the only difference in this in the interpretation um, is that instead of doing a um, DNA uh, extraction or swapping the rings for a potential DNA reading, um, we would we basically simulated exactly what the metal detector reading would be. So it's very it's like kilohertz, so it's very very small. But um, essentially, when a ring enters a search coil. Um, this is simulating the metal detector search coil, the beep that goes off is like, we basically got the numbers of what it would take for that to happen and the, the sound that is generated. Um, so that was really beautiful to see this like oscilloscope, which is the, the kind of wavelengths like move very slightly when a ring entered the, that red um, wire. And so we, uh, again, kind of displayed it very similarly, but um, I think it's also, again, quite interesting that this, the kind of sets of, of uh, loss were imitating each other, I mean, it, but in a completely different place. It was on the beaches of Atlantic City, a, you know, a casino town notably, and um, it was kind of interesting to see how, who, what kind of what aesthetics were within these rings versus the aesthetics that were in the rings that were lost in New York City. Um, and then these were displayed at the new museum. And so, okay, so then as the practice goes on, this, so those last projects were from like 2019 and then jumped to 2021. And this one is also from 2021. And I think what is important to kind of underline is like these ways of accessing, you know, personal narrative, sight, and um, change through through objects and their circumstances of being either removed or like or taken out of their system. So for this um, for this uh, next series of uh, works or project. Um, I was looking at the site of Century 21, and it's it's a department store. It was a department store here that was 
quite um, well known because of its approach to kind of taking designer um, uh, clothing and designer goods um, at excess as they would come out of the brand um, or um, you know big brand names. And they would basically Century 21, I think, would buy from big brand names, whatever wasn't selling, and then sell it again at a discount price. And that model was like kind of amazing when department stores were quite large and in our lives more. And so this, I look at this site because it's an interesting um, cycle of resilience, let's say. And the uh, what I mean by that is that the, the um, Century 21 that I was quite fixated on was one that was located right next to the World Trade Center. I had gone there when I was like a child and just kind of seeing these ways of people at a young age, like going very um, heavily into the racks and the kind of clothes going everywhere and this extreme excess that happens within a department store itself and discount one of that um, in that matter. But I had been also interested in as to how this store was finally kind of being affected by, and this was during COVID, but being affected because of um, the forces of COVID. So it, it was resilient during 9-11, meaning that it reopened right after it suffered a lot of damage, the one that was downtown. And, but then, because I think, of course, we live in a much heavier period of the internet. The experience economy didn't like it, it was very much flattening based on um, the internet, but then COVID comes in and then you have this reality that is there's no longer spaces like this that are needed at this extent because we just have so much at our fingertips via the online and um, and so I would basically go and day by day, like just kind of almost watch how this site was disintegrating. And it was actually interesting because I was starting to realize that they were selling everything and anything, meaning that they were selling their, um, the kiosks, they were selling, you know, I, I basically purchased this rack, but um, the infrastructure part and the clothing was at an extreme discount. And there were people that were still shopping, but then there was also people that were liquidating the store. And I thought that those two things together being seen at the same time was a great definition of like the extensive, like even capitalism, just making sure that we get the capitalism and then also restructuring through bankruptcy, making sure you get everything out of there. And, um, I was also really fascinated as to how these uh, people that were liquidating the um, department store, I remember there were these two women, how they were remembering everything that was in the store price-wise, where it was located. Um, and again, go, kind of going back to that repetition that I was mentioning when you work in a service industry, this is just the memory that's lodged through these you know, types of routines and that are needed to be done is, is was really wild to me. Um, so I would go throughout the store and as I was mentioning, since they were liquidating everything um, and sort of select pieces that were indications of technology change, labor, and also just kind of in a way like really beautiful, like um, tactile. So in this sense, I was always in general, I'm always drawn to handwriting, but in this sense, I was very drawn to this handwriting of on the um, cosmetics extensions. And um, mainly because I just thought the description and then the kind of number setting was, was really interesting. And so this is then uh, the show that came about um, that type of kind of pillaging, I would say, at Century 21. And it was shown at, um, the Hessel Museum at Bard. And as you can see in the front, I mean, maybe it's not very obvious, but it's a, I had flattened one of these kiosks that I had purchased and sort of recreated this walk and experience through memory change. And then also sort of the flattening of the experience economy by way of technology. And um, 
this was a piece that also maybe starts to address that a, a bit where I had the phone and a random numbers uh, table that was generated actually by the RAND Corporation as um, one of the first random number tables that eventually gives like a lot of support to statistics and computers and um, and is used to sample for, for those fields. And um, I just put it alongside the phone because I thought it would be kind of interesting to think about when you disengage an object from its system, like how this phone is disengaged from its its main line, that it, you know, the the way that we remember numbers and the way that we remember phone numbers, it just at a certain point it doesn't matter because it doesn't exist anymore. So just kind of like playing around with that type of um that sort of overlapping like visual through the numbers and the, that question. Um, and then I was able to get a lot of clothing and was somehow just wanted to recreate this weird memory that I had as a, as a child by looking directly at those racks and making kind of a nod to, to color and to um, kind of minimalism a little bit, but then also you kind of, you go around this wall and then it's just this whole kind of, I wanted to evoke a messy rack, but it's a rack of clothing that that was, that lists very high prices, but you watch them go down as, as they are on the tag. So it would be like absurd prices compared to, um, or basically absurd prices that were overstamped with like, lower and lower numbers. And yeah, so you can see that you go behind the wall and you can experience like and look through the clothes. And so this was in the other room and, and uh, this was a kiosk that was in full form. And I just thought that these objects were quite important to kind of show sort of the support, the not the support, but like the types of um, relationship to where you stand when you're checking out or you know or someone's purchasing a, an object and then you sort of like release that from its environment and and then the positioning isn't kind of defined anymore um but when you would enter this room you basically would um the receipt machine would print and it was just a series of notes that i had written um, about the the uh, project itself and sort of ended up becoming a little bit like nonsensical. Um, and the light box in the back is this whole, um, is actually one day in March 1st, 2002 when Century 21 reopens, but I don't really indicate where that slide is. Um, I just allow it to exist there because I, as I was mentioning, I think it, the show deals a lot with um, different layers of memory and how we remember. And I just thought it would be kind of funny to have this one day exist in a microfilm um, and not really indicate where it was located because it's kind of just deciding what to remember in a way. But this is, um, this is, I'm going to see, like right here is where the, where an article that talks about Century 21 reopening and it's, um, it's sort of power of giving people hope during that time post 9-11. But I, the nice part about this, um, the um, light box is that you can actually just see really very vaguely, but very clearly like big ads and like strange events that were happening across that period. Um, and then, so I was also kind of making a little bit of a nod to where um, uh, deep fake images were going to go or sort of like this simulated experience. And that left piece is um, just the canvas for a, a deep fake image to learn on. So meaning like it's just a bunch of pixels that make up that size of an image. And then the, the uh, piece on the right is this um, lipstick piece that I had everybody write down um, their favorite lipstick and you could basically search these numbers online and that lipstick will show up but again the hand coming back and like this strange form of um, color and preference and even like security in a, in a very feminine feminine way where I think many um, people that wear lipstick are inclined to a specific color and it makes them feel a certain way so 
And this was a YouTube video of a woman that was shopping throughout Century 21. So again, talking about the experience economy in this realm. So then I get to this point with um, the works where basically, and I know time-wise it might be a little tight soon, but basically I've um, was extremely interested in this next set of objects. Um, but I was interested in it because of the way that these ob this set of objects, which are these coins that were um, used to pay for a uh, bus fare um, in New York City, and they have no monetary value. Um, I was really interested in how they kind of hold this almost intactility um, of time and passage and the places that people visit and they almost are like this strange non-site. Um, but this is an image of when I had gone to the MTA auction and people were looking over these coins and seeing if they um, were uh, basically able to be melted down. Like they have a magnet and they're trying to see what metals that are within them. And when I received the coins, because I, I it was an auction and I had won the auction. They came to me in these like very heavy bank bags. There were 800 pounds of these coins. And I had just been, again, very kind of taken aback that a system and, a, and um, specifically the MTA would be seeking, you know, money for this non-money, which I found was really funny. This is how the... Um, the coins looked in my studio and right before I had figured out how to work with them. So these are gonna be shown, these were shown at the Whitney um, for the biennial. And what I had done kind of evolving this, you know, big mess was I finally figured out that there was a pattern within these coins, meaning like the coins could be categorized in a way that I had made up, but they don't, um, there were five large categories and one coin could not, basically one, every coin could fit into one of those five categories. And those categories became these five tables and um, they range from religious tokens um, to arcade and casino tokens, to um, tokens that are from restrooms, um, to uh, just kind of imitation money and then also just hardware. So the five categories were um, faith, um, imitation, uh, chance, place, and blank. And so through those things, I, through those five categories, I was also really um, interested in how that reflects kind of the movements of people, of commuters, and and maybe even just generally society, how it, how, you know, religion is involved and then also gambling and then, you know, um, play. And there was a lot of casino and arcade tokens and um, the place in the place category would show uh, like iconic sites that people got flattened pennies made at. And so all of these things, I was just, all of these instances of places um, that were documented within these coins and, you know, used and then put forward through a system that they're not meant to really be in, um, gave me a lot of, like, kind of dynamic information sets about people, about um, type, the ways of, um, I guess, observing what was in, I guess, a person's pocket in a very intimate way. Um, and then also seeing seeing the, the the ways of getting, I guess, through a transit system. Um, it's it's interesting to have this question of, of if somebody had cheated the transit system, did they, you know, what is that? How does that look like? Or did was that even you know a known thing, or did it just did the coins just fall to the bottom of the? Um, open face drop that they have in the bus and like it was just unknown. So it's, so these things are, are always really interesting to me. And I basically wanted to, um, to kind of deliver a qualitative and quantitative way of looking at the city. So the, um, the text came in and the text in the background is 
the front and back of each coin. And that um, language set was also really important for me to show repetition, to kind of show a little bit of um, specificity, but also show like nonsense in a way, which I think is interesting when you think about the periphery in, in, a, in a place. And it's, it's super important I, as well, I think. So these are more installation shots. This is the chance pile. It had like more colorful tokens, which is really nice. Um, this is place. This is uh, imitation. This is the uh, faith, which was a lot of religious tokens that were mainly, I want to say mainly coming from uh, Catholic charities, because that uh, gold is this one angel token that was very popular. And it was, I think it's important to like emphasize the repetition in some of these coins because definitely one person is not using that. It's it's multiple people. So this is the um, blank pile. Um, yeah, the blank pile was really beautiful because it was just hard. It was um, uh, hardware and also batteries. And uh, so this is just a close up of the text. And then we also made a book that was detailing the front and back of each coin closely, because I think that in that big installation, um, you do like it's it's it was so important for me to show amount and show like scale, but then the scale of the object being so small and being so intimate was was also important to document. But as you can see, like these might get lost if you look at just the pile. It's just a guitar pick. And this would be in the uh, the religion pile or faith pile. Um, this was funny. It was like a. a it's from this artist uh, group, Claire Fontaine, and it was from a show they did in 2016, but I found, I put it in the faith pile, but I just thought it was a funny instance where another artwork kind of slipped into this one. Um, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly and then I'm probably gonna wrap it up, um, wrap up the talk. But basically this was a show that um, just happened now in at the Renaissance Society. Um, it was a group show and it was just a, a kind of an interesting or a different way of me dealing with a site that I accessed, but I didn't, wasn't able to witness it. Um, these very, uh, you know, kind of delicate, uh, images or delicate silk screens on the wall are of, um, let me just go into this. They're of uh, HVAC uh, logs from the American Stock Exchange building. And I just found it really uh, kind of amazing that I had found these papers there and their document, um, basically the difference changes in, in the air circulation and the heating um, as it, took place over the summer of uh, 2006 and 2005. Um, and I thought it was really important to kind of sort of map out this, uh, I guess, kind of ebb and flow of time. And it was a way of seeing a different perspective of, um, of course, maintenance, but also of control and sort of, you know, almost like having an equilibrium for power so because they're basically, um, these logs are making sure the air is, uh, is at a good temperature for the systems and the stock exchange to be you know, running, so the operating systems. Um, but I thought it was, I, I thought it was something again, like similar to the coins, just for me, like it's a very non-graspable way of measuring. And the fact that the hand has allowed that to be um, permanent, in terms of you know someone just comes along like me and finds it, it, it that was quite interesting um and actually this is spring 2007 so it's just before the stock market crash and i thought uh it was also quite interesting to see that summer and spring had different volumes of um of change and so just again it was it was kind of in relation to the dryness of the uh, of the um, library, but you had moments of a little bit of humanity in terms of uh, just actions that I could maybe visualize more so than others. 
Okay, so then this, um, I'm gonna wrap it up after this, but this is the work I've been doing for Pompeii. It's basically these, I had taken these photographs of these um, returned objects that I find are really amazing. And they, I think they describe really dynamic ways of viewing history and like um, the desire to kind of consume history. Um, but throughout the years, people have taken like little fragments of the park um, in, you know, it could range from like small stones to like little bits of uh, um, marble to like mosaic flooring, like tiny little pieces. And um, they would hold on to these objects for whatever amount of time. And then something happens within their life where they're, the person just feels inclined to, or something happens for them to feel guilty that they have this object and they're inclined to return it back to the park. And so the park receives all of the archaeological park receives all of these um, kind of notes that explain why they have had this, in this case, these ashes that are volcanic ashes, why they've had them since the 1980s. Um, this is specific to this note and why they uh, are seeking to return them. And it could, again, be something that happened in life or it could be just I guess something a little bit more general like COVID or, um, and, but I thought that it was amazing to kind of think about how does something get repurposed into a value that would no, I would say would never be seen as such. I mean, the site generates these values of anything probably that you, one takes from Pompeii is gonna be, we're gonna remember it as such, but it's just funny that now this gets returned to the site and it's in the form of, this, you know, in this tin with this volcanic ash, and it's kind of in a way being re-archived, or it has a place in its archive because this, the park saves all of these. So that's that's kind of what I'm working on right now, and that dynamic is like is incredibly interesting to me of of um, sort of this hallucination of of um, of experience and and how it's manifested through through. Um, even taking and removal and and then returning. And then another aspect to the project is looking at repetition of loss and kind of comparing it to the um, previous works that I had done, which is uh, I was interested in all the rings that were had survived or jewelry and for that matter that survived the the um, uh, volcanic eruption and and then how that material survives and then also, the kind of unearthing and the um, everyday loss of you know rings in this in this moment. Um, so I'm still developing these things, but but um, I had published a, a writing about um, the, my kind of interpretations of loss and place and distance and um, with the um, Pompeii commitment. But I will end it there because I know that we're a little tight on time. <laughs> I'm wondering. Uh... It's obviously there's so much research involved mm -hmm. so much. And I love the things like the names going into the um, psychic everything. So interesting research. Uh, but also like such a um, sharp like sensibility like visual presentation. I love how it's all sort of um, shown display. How uh, like, are you thinking while we have research of how it's going to be displayed, where is that an institute, or is it sort of like once everything is cataloged and studied, then do you think how am I going to display this, or how does that time work? Yeah, I think that. Um, so sometimes the objects are so heavy in terms of like the, that's what I was trying to kind of explain when I with that picture of the crowd, I was sort of it it makes sense to me internally it might not make sense to people like externally but it was it, it was extremely hard to figure out do I deal with this as a group or do I deal with it as individual pieces and how do I how can I achieve that middle ground so for the coins I I had the same struggle I was like should I deal with them individually and that would be crazy because it would, it's way too many and I'd have to think about a different installation and stuff but yeah, I eventually, in some in some capacity, I eventually get there, but it's definitely running alongside me as I'm, as I'm dealing with the object. But when I'm going to different places and bringing the object to different people, 
sometimes I just, um, I don't necessarily even think about how it's going to manifest. I'm like, I know I'm, I'm seeking to, to kind of get a sound bite of information. And, and then in, in a good way, I get, I get almost like an environmental experience of me holding these objects. Like I remember with the rings from the subway, I would often carry them in my bag on the subway. And I was thinking that that was such a crazy experience feeling to have this archive that was running within the system that it came from. And um, and yeah, not that it was, yeah, it was just an interesting feeling to have. So I think, it, I think about display when I have all the information that's there, but then, but it also gets really tricky too, I would say. Yo, congrats on all your accomplishments. Oh, thank you. Okay. I guess all your work at uh, baby schools you can too. Um, oh yeah. It's like school. That's like where my question starts. It's like um like in the broad scope of like how labels are like distributed in the art world. Um have you like uh, gotten or you like done a lever of like your accomplishments and like the label that that's like put it against to me? And like um I guess my question is like um is it like if you make artwork in a certain genre or like a certain uh, concept, does that like uh, put you in the position of like walk and load? Like you're just like never going to be able because like um, I never knew the work I was looking at at base of the size of the one at um the land. Um that's actually my favorite because this whole show I thought it was like really calm and like the idea of like but then I never thought how did you blend these points like that never like I don't know why I didn't think like that connection but um, yeah I'm just like interested in the labeling and your Yeah no I think that's a really good question and I think um so I I don't feel like that I have to I'm beholden to a specific type or way of working. I just set it up for myself in the sense that it's like I, I want to constantly work with things that are evolving to the next point. So I objects that sort of can get me out of um, kind of the habitual way of dealing with something. So like with the rings, even when I did that a second time, just to be very like, straightforward, I was like myself, I was like, oh, I'm not, I wish I could have more fun figuring out this method. Um, and and I did have fun, but I I just was it was a familiar method of working. So this the the set of the MTA rings, and then also the set of the Atlantic City rings, and then I finally came to this like the realization of actually it's just really it's almost like this strange math occurrence that this the same set of rings repeats themselves, and that was interesting to me. So then that kind of ends up growing something that I'm I guess I'm interested in continuing with, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, it's, I have so many things to say to that question because it's really good and I'm just trying to think about a helpful way to talk about that. But I think with the, like, I don't basically do one type of work. I think that's the thing I don't feel like, again, beholden to just making um, text work or just making sculpture. I, I need to have a variety of things happening. And I think that's what doesn't make me like feel like I have a label per se, but maybe someone will be like, oh, you just deal with objects and you deal with histories through objects. And sometimes it's not as, you know, um, handmade, but I, I think that that's also when I was mentioning in the beginning, like the practice will just keep growing. And I think these, the directions that are there are going to allow for more who knows maybe more 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 of my hand to come back or because in the beginning i wasn't um necessarily just doing objects but i was i was really doing kind of this pouring into objects this materiality this kind of pushing things into a position through material and stuff but it was always a found object and it was, but now that I don't, sometimes I don't even want to say found objects for these works because they're so purposely like <laughs> collected and like trying, I'm trying to achieve the, the collection or achieve access to something. So I'm not just like, oh, I found this on the ground, you know, but I used to do that. But um, 
but yeah, I think I, it's a good question. I think I'm not necessarily, I don't feel beholden to a specific way of working, but I do put myself there sometimes too, if that makes sense. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't have to call it a, a label necessarily, but um, I, I sense a lot of like, nostalgia in the work too. And I'm wondering if you have, if that makes sense to you, or it's like, is that something you realize? Like, I, I found some consistency with that. It's like there is a nostalgic sense to like each work, whether it's yours or like, maybe a different past culture or someone else's, but I think this. What are your views on the Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm trying to remember was something I read once about nostalgia that really stuck with me is that it can be distortion. And I don't necessarily think about these moments as nostalgic. I think they're more familiar repetitions of what happens when, like for example, with the rings, um, again like when anything is like when that very small moment it could be insignificant or extremely significant how that's been occurring through time so in this specific image just like i know this the, the one from pompeii is because of the destruction that led that was promoted through the volcanic eruption but the fact that that material withstood the heat of that day and then you have this other kind of contemporary condition where who knows like in how someone lost a ring in the subway, but still there's these forces that allow that to happen. And so I kind of find that I don't look to nostalgia for that. I look to almost like these occurrences that just this type of like loop that I just is strange to me. Um, and maybe in the earlier works of like with Deb's work of the world of Windows on the World, there might be, a, it, I don't know if it's, in, I could even say it's nostalgia because I wasn't even there to experience it. I was more just kind of coming, I was interested in, in how her memory was operating as a framework or an architecture that I could navigate as, a, as right now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's always important to think about, for me, it's important to think about how does nostalgia play a role, but I don't, I think it doesn't play a role so heavily um, for me. I, I think I definitely have anchors of memory that drive the works, but I don't, I don't want to have a nostalgic relationship, if that makes sense. But it's a good question because I, I definitely think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's not that I don't see this as a nostalgia, but it's not that I feel like I can't do the function. And you know, I'm looking at it to a Istanbul, trying to have information about the start of the world, to history, meaning that that rules upon that is a psychic that wants to bring about the world. All these pictures. So it's more of a problem for a Bible to see. Yeah, no, I, I think definitely. I think also, I mean, just how dynamic an object can be in, in its in its circulation and it again with the Century 21 show, the forces that are pushing out certain sites that have been used over and over again and that hold an identity for a place and like, um, yeah, also how objects and memory kind of rub against each other. And um, yeah, I, I think this is kind of where I'm, where I'm going with, with all of them. And, and also how they give, they allow me to create relationships with people too, because a lot of, like, I don't know if I would have met Deb if I, I definitely wouldn't have met Deb if I didn't buy those postcards and she happens to be a really good friend to this day. So, and also I think, yeah, that's another, that, not to go on a tangent, but that's another um, line of things I'm going to do in the future. I make a book with her and um, of her photographs and yeah. Okay. Um, just speaking of one, <clears throat> well, thank you, it's really um, 
It takes a lot to explain your work, right? There, there's so many layers both in terms of you know, the, the thinking behind it, the steps you take. Um, attention spans are so short. So I was thinking to myself, like when you're pitching this, or when you're trying to ask me to connect with this, say, how show, or even as though you appreciate the work. Do you find some frustration in that you know people are not necessarily all that comfortable with going through a full story of a very specific person, maybe? And so just the aesthetic quality of the composition, maybe as far as the work is going to take somebody in terms of their experience with her, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I will say that I don't necessarily run into too many of those encounters. If anything, I'm just, it's maybe if I'm not getting, you know, so many people hitting me up for shows or something, you know, like, I then I'm like, actually, it's fine because I have to work on like so many, I need to work on more bodies of, of ideas. Um, but usually it's, it's, I've found throughout the years that the people that approach me are the people that have a good, how do I say, the people that approach me are the people that have, are invested in like these kinds of viewing, uh, these ways of looking at either the archive or history or just the everyday as it relates to a city, specifically maybe New York, or it could relate to, you know, like a, an object that has a, the, I just somehow find these people that are there that are also kind of interested in um, these things. But yeah, the intention span is very short, but I kind of saw at the Whitney that it was a little bit, I was surprised that actually it grabbed people's attention. And I think, um, as I continue, I, I do like to make work at that scale, actually. And sometimes in the past, as, as I've shown, that maybe it wasn't, I wasn't um, able to do so because of just experience and um, also space and all this stuff. But, um, but yeah, I would say that I think that the rings also, I'm always really surprised on how people just spend time with them. I think it's not, it's the, the amount of text isn't too much, which I think is important. Um, but they really, yeah, they, they really, people really spend time with them. And I definitely was taken aback by that when I first showed them. But yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely not work that's super loud. And I, I'm really aware of that. But I think um, when you just give the op, the, where the objects are coming from, when you give that a moment, then it becomes, maybe, you know, the volume that gets higher. Yeah. yeah, I saw, when I saw your work at the Whitney, um, I had this like transcendent experience with it because in my pocket was a washer I've been carrying. And it's like, you, I should have taken it out <laughs> at a certain point, you know, or thrown it in my toolbox, you know? Yeah. But somehow the same was just like all these things in my own chat. Why is this weird? Mm -hmm. You know, and so when I went and saw the language table, I was like, oh my gosh, my picture. Mm -hmm. I was constantly just watching and trying to just add my own address to the art, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that was, I didn't want to disrespect my own washer. I mean, it's art. So I found like this like intrinsic like affection, something that is relatively meaningless, mm -hmm. you know, worthless, you know, this you it brought like an attention to my own, you know, name. Yeah. You know, the reason I want, you know, they want to. You find it hard to be 
Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, objectivity to your practice in the way that you kind of categorize things. You find it hard to maintain objectivity and to categorize these. You feel like there is an, an innate personality to some of the objects. You need them, like the psychic guy imagine that this rain is crying. You know, I don't know if it's a psychic. No, it's like, there's more mm -hmm. Or uh, you know, talk about antiques, you know, the woo, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just pick up on that. What kind of relationship you build with these materials that are in the end. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing psychics tell me often is like be careful what you um hold on to or what you find, because they have, you know, whatever. I mean, even a jeweler recently told me this. It's like, be careful what you collect. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think with the categories and the coins, that was just a really strange occurrence that I just still cannot describe. And maybe I'm, maybe it's not as crazy to me as it is, you know, like it's not as crazy to other people as it is to me, but I just think it was incredible that let's say they weren't, they didn't have to be defined as those five categories, but generally that each coin could fit into a specific place. Meaning if I really wanted to, I could just put all the Chuck E. Cheese coins together, have a huge pile and then all the arcade coins and all those like tokens that were from a specific church and all, it just was really, the repetition was really um, baffling. And, um, but in, yeah, I mean, in terms of the objectivity there, I, I think that sometimes what happens is that a lot of these objects will lead me down places that are kind of these rabbit holes that are really hard to get out of. Um, and then I have to kind of be a little bit more like kind of set boundaries with the objects, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's also, I mean, it's really great to hear that you've you've had an experience like that with the coins because that's what I'm trying to describe about repetition is that even across like, you know, whatever 2000 years in this photograph is like, you still have that same form of a ring. And, or, I mean, I know that jewelry in this sense and gold has been around forever, but it's just, it's, you know, it's not as far off. And that relationship is always, it's, it's really interesting. And the relationship that you've had to the washer and seeing that again, like, seeing these things circulate in that way, it's, it's really interesting. And yeah, interesting to hear too. So I see a lot of like fact in your work where you do a lot of research and you go through archives or you even like scientifically process some of the items, but also feel a strong sense of like fiction and speculation and like, distorted memory and retelling other people's stories, whether or not it's accurate or misremembered. I feel like those are very opposing things, the sort of imagination versus like whole heart mm -hmm. Do you think it's like the fiction and the invention that you bring to it that holds the audience? Because if it was just, you know, cold facts, I feel like people would not be as interested in it. Yeah, um, I think that when I was going through the explanation of the rings, having first having first thought that maybe I would get a lot of you know interesting scientific information of mitochondrial DNA from the rings. I mean that's a little bit wild and crazy because it's metals are really difficult. It's hard to retain information like that on metals, and it was very like, labor intensive and it it just didn't have the results I was looking for. Um, and if I just stayed there, I would just, you know, I, it would be so rooted in, in the direction or leaning into a scientific reading that I just, I don't fully um, have when I look at all these everyday occurrences. Um, but I think that's the thing with value is like all these interpretations and all these ways of determining something is definitely um, of purpose or definitely important in one's life. Um, these cycles of it, that's for the ring project, I was very much trying to bring that out. Um, so meaning, yeah, the monetary value and the scientific value and the spiritual value and how that's constantly orbiting around us every single day. 
um, in some capacity, and it's very different, like you know, for everybody. But um, but yeah, I think the narrative part is super important. Um, speculation in narrative and and in science too. So yeah. It's okay with you all. I think I kind of want to lead you into a question. Almost eight, give or not. Um, so, I, I, one of the things I really enjoyed about your talk was that you were able to narrativize and tell the story of your process, which revealed the dimension of your work that wasn't visible to me in the work itself when I encountered it. Uh, I guess just that the game you can do, you know, but I was really intrigued by and impressed by the way you seem to um, kind of follow your nose, how the work seems to lead you in a way. Mm -hmm. Really, you're, you're following these very idiosyncratic instincts or intuitions, like and you have the confidence, I think, to say, okay, you know what, this is worthy of my time and attention. Mm -hmm. Paying attention to things in a way that maybe two other people might. Mm -hmm. And then elevating things to a level of importance, saying this is worthy of time and attention to. And underscoring that by, in the way you choose to display them. It's so different from the way, um, a, a non-artist scholar, you know, someone in the social sciences, an archaeologist or anthropologist who will pursue research because they have a different set of criteria. You didn't make your own criteria. Mm -hmm. And they're weird. And mm -hmm. that to me is so much of where the art is. But that's much more clear to me having you having heard you tell the story. How um, you, you know, you pause and pay attention, like noticing that there was liquidation going on while people were shopping at Century 21. Um, you didn't talk as much about the choices you make and how you present the work. And that is where, that is what I was able to read to see my people. Like I noticed in the piece that was at the new museum that the text was so screen mm -hmm. um, to the museum board, which was inside all the rings, and that the frames were these kind of clip, I think they were stainless steel, even even the um what's it called the spacers. Uh it just seemed like a lot of attention was paid to presentation. You know, well, I think in everything, and I would love to have seen the piece of it, the hustle, because it seemed like you kind of busted out there in a way. Could you just speak briefly about some of the presentation choices? For example, not um, doing an inkjet print, yeah, but doing a silk screen for the with the rings. Yeah, and also the Whitney pieces. So these, those are those text pieces are all silk screened. I think that it. I mean, there's a few things. It makes it more um, like kind of archival or a little even like going into archaic ways of working. Um, I somehow just really love silk screen because it's this moment of just yeah, this one instance of generating the print, and you have this this text that you can't really imitate again in that form, um, of course, with additions and stuff. But um, presentation, yeah, I am i don't know. I, I really uh, take a lot of time with presentation, and I definitely make sure it's at a place that I feel like it's going to do a service to the object. And I think most of the time, because the object is being needs to be shown in not necessarily an elevation, but it needs to be really shown through through a, a clarity that I I really just, you know, I've, I've developed these methods of, with the rings and like, I, this is like the one way I can show it where 
that little thing becomes heightened. And otherwise, like I like I showed in a few slides in that um, development of the the, pro, um, the project that I had them on a table, and I was really interested in just having them on a table like that. But then I realized, like you know, you just get lost, and you don't get lost in the way that I want you to get lost. It's like I want you to kind of do that selection of your own whatever you, gravitates towards you as a viewer in the rings set up in that way. I want that to happen like so you just choose one or two or however many and those choices are are based on your aesthetics or your curiosity or something um and yeah but in terms of just in general presentation i i don't know necessarily where it, it comes from i just feel like i'm constantly thinking about how to underline the object circulation and whatever parameters I've set up it's like that's kind of like with the coins I I was so happy to finally just dump the object on the table because that was the, the biggest way of showing mass at least um there's a lot of iterations in that project um that uh slightly drove me crazy but they uh, you mean there were iterations where I was like, I don't even know how I would have been able to execute these things, and they would have it would have been completely different. Um, but yeah, I mean, I sometimes I don't even know a hundred percent what my relationship to certain aesthetics are. It's just I kind of feel like I'm, and not to repeat myself, but I feel like I'm doing the elevation of the object in a way that we can see it for the direction I'm trying to show it in, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like one of the ways of describing your process when it comes to the end is distillation. Yeah. Uh, there's a kind of maximalism or excessiveness in your research process, very indulgent in a way, but then there's this restraint in distillation that has the effect of intensifying and mm -hmm. focusing attention. The patterns, you know, Keep in mind, I think excels in, in path finding and also pattern recognition. But both are, are fundamentally creative because they're it, it's like finding things that in a certain sense aren't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also yeah, it's bringing forward all these parts that are you know they're they're disparate parts like they don't exist together as a unit. And what I'm doing is making sure that they. Can one can look at these instances as a unit, and even if they don't like live on as a unit in terms of I don't know how, just um, even as the piece or something, as long as they were together at some point, I think that's really important because, like what like basically since we're all in New York City, it's just like all of us are together for whatever reason and it's incredibly powerful and that creates a lot of dynamic experiences in the city and everyone's really close and you know, jam-packed. And so that's with the rings, I kind of see that. With the coins, I see that. It's like all of these experiences happen because we exist and move in a place and the, we constantly lose things. And we can't, And I'm not an artist that's constantly dealing with loss in that sense. I'm thinking about forces around that, um, push objects out of their placements and the speculation that comes up from those things is is multi-pronged and um and yeah and also like thinking about the fact that these belong to individuals and like you know that afterlife is also really incredible and the um yeah the, the potential owners and who you know the aesthetics and all that stuff so that's that's where I come from in a way.